Lucy Rue from uh, Ready at Dawn. Everybody. Yes. Jason Rubin, who's the uh, content creator of, or you, you kind of own everything. VP of content. Yeah. VP of content uh, for Oculus. And we have a funny story to tell you, which is kind of on brand since we're talking about narrative in, in VR. Um, obviously, we could sit here and talk all day about Lone Echo 2. That's what we want to talk about, of course. Uh, who played Lone Echo? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you're who we are trying to reach, uh, so thank you so much. His name is Tim. Um, there, I, I have notes, don't worry, so I'm going to try and stay on brand as much as I can, but uh, we, we can talk about Lone Echo, which 89 Metacritic, which yeah. is, we all know, it's super hard to get, especially for a VR title. Um, Swept the awards. Uh, was such a unique experience. I was a part of it. I got to play Jack, um, written and directed by this lovely man. And first, I kind of want to rewind the clock a little bit because I remember parts of how this whole thing came to be. And I remember parts of it because it's been a while. And also, it was in Vegas. So there's, a, there's spotty memories of, of how, <laughs> how it came to be. But what I remember is 2014. Yeah. Sounds right. right. Okay. 2014. Um, you and I were having a drink up at the cool lounge at the Cosmo Hotel, and it's, it was super vibing. It's more like uh, system, uh, the systems that I have in place, the mechanics I have in place, you didn't even have it, you just had like a hope, and <laughs> no plan, just a hope and an idea of what it could well, be. Well, you started with the mechanic, yeah. the yeah. zero gravity, moving yourself around in zero gravity mechanic, which nobody had done before in any medium, because there had never been anything like VR before. And we didn't think it would work because we thought there was too much motion and the time. We were new to VR, we thought this is gonna make people uncomfortable. Yeah. And Ready at Dawn basically created this locomotion that gets around some of the challenges of VR. Uh, I don't you should tell the story how you came up with it. But. I mean, the, 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 the thing was for us, getting into VR was not just about making another game. I think even when I talked to you about narrative in VR, it wasn't just about like, all right, cool, VR is now here, let's make a game, we'll figure it out, and we'll just make a traditional game. It was, with the intent of solving something that we felt needed to be solved. So uh, I think the very first thing, as you said, was uh, building a mover model. A few of the guys at work actually were looking at what exactly that would mean, and we looked at uh, astronauts in space on the ISS and the way they moved, and we realized that, like you know, with, uh, with the, uh, the motion that they had, pulling and pushing and pulling basically around the world, it gave kind of like that sensation of. of presence, but also the fact that you didn't feel uncomfortable in VR when you knew that your hand and your eye distance was you know, kind of exact. Every time you pulled, the velocity actually matched. So suddenly that some, sometimes uncomfortable part of VR just went away. We pitched that. It's we actually genius because we don't track your feet. Yeah. So you're like, what motion, what locomotion do you have that doesn't use your feet, your hands? Well, what do you do? The climb actually did a pretty good job yeah. figuring out that you could do climbing without your feet, although in real life, climbing is mostly your feet. And then you were like, well, zero gravity is perfect because you're pushing off. And by coincidence, you stumbled on the fact that if your eye and your hand get that connection, when your inner ear says, I'm not actually moving, yeah. your eye and hand connection, your brain's kind of like, go with the two on one thing. Two are saying you're moving, I'll go with the two. And it just is comfortable. Yeah. And it was when I first played, it was like miraculous. You're like, this works. I remember the first time that I sat down, I came to the studio, drove down to Irvine, and I, I walked into the studio. And this is before the actual hand controller came out. They were just prototypes at that point. So you, you put a controller in my hand, and I sat down at, on the chair and played through it. I, I kind of fumbled through it a little bit. I was doing okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a decent gamer, but I the the, control, the, the experience felt intuitive, but the controls didn't. And I came out about I was like, how was like seven minutes? Like no, you've been there for like fifteen or twenty minutes. I'm like that's impossible. No one's in VR for that long. You're like, I want to show you something we haven't shown. And he put the controls in my hands, and instantly, first yeah, of all, I just stood up. I was like, this is what I want. I once my like you said, once my mind made the connection of this and this, and I had done VR before. But the thing that always helped me up was like, how do you get over traversal? Because if I'm not walking my character, this is how it ties in the narrative too. Ludo narrative dissonance is what we're always, you and I have this huge conversation about this. How do I as a player not instantly become, in contrast with the player that I'm trying to play as, and if I do that, any narrative that's trying to be imposed upon me, I'm automatically at odds with because I'm not doing that, I don't feel that. And I know that you're a man that likes to make statements. Clearly you are too. 
what statement are you wanting to make with, and it's not just about, hey, we, we fix traversal, or we figure out how mechanics how to do this, because at the forefront of this game is the relationship between Jack and Liv. Yeah. Well, it could have been a shooter, right? You could yeah. have taken it and said, oh, put guns in your hand, great, it's a space shooter. Yeah. That's not what you did. Yeah, it was actually trying to figure out what our DNA as a studio was, and we, we knew that we told games, like uh, made games with character, made games that were narrative, about stories, about people, about you know relationships, and and even in our early years, actually working on, on games on other IPs, that's kind of always what we want to find is connection between characters, player, and NPCs. And that's how Jack was born. I mean, the movement was at the genesis of building Lone Echo. The funny thing about it is that the IP came after. So the IP was built around this idea that like, all right, we're gonna be in zero G, we're gonna make this game the future of humanity. And that decision also drove, I mean, being in VR also drove the fact that you were not human. And that's what everybody expected. I think I remember the first time we basically pitched the idea even to the team of uh, the main character not being you. You would want to play human, right? You're in VR, you're, you are the character. You're not, no longer playing the character. You're actually the character, and you are embodying this character that's going through a journey and a relationship with another NPC character in the game. And we decided the best way to do that is for you not to be human. And that was very, very kind of like uh, something that I wanted to do from the very beginning, purely because it was one of those ways to actually bring back what you talked about, the dissonance between the player character and the player. And, and it's important, those of you who haven't played in VR before, when you say, well, you're not playing a human, you're like, I don't play humans in games all the time. What's the difference? The difference is that when you hold your arm out in front of you, it's a robot arm. And you turn it over, and it's a robot arm. And you point your finger, and everything you're doing is happening, but you're seeing the robot arm with all of the mechanics move. And you grab things, and you pull yourself, and you move, and you are the robot right. in a way that you're never going to be in anything yeah. seen through a window. You are the robot in VR. And that's a weird experience for people. They, you know, I, <laughs> this is not my arm, right? right. And it's, it's, it's jarring, but it totally works. And you just you become the robot. Exactly. And, and that, that brings also the, the, the way we, we kind of started partnering on it. I, I knew what we were trying to do. I just didn't know how the character was going to really work out, right? It, it's, it's hard to basically say, hey, Troy, You've done so much in games. You gotta play a robot. Yeah. <laughs> you have no soul. Now you get to be typecast. That, that was my point. The, well, I mean, the three of us, and, and we're not alone, certainly, because I've, I've, we can point to many games that the games that can, the franchise, the IPs that continue to sell, the, the tentpole games of this industry continue to be narrative driven, and I believe in narrative driven games. I believe in narrative driven games. Absolutely. I believe, I remember one time in an interview, someone said, when do you think that TV and film will begin to bridge the gap? I was like, homie, TV and film are standing on the shore right now looking at us trying to figure out how they get to where we are. Because the difference is, I can watch a show and it can be really, really good. But there's a difference, like you said, when it's my hand and I'm in this and I have a relationship with someone in this game. And now you're real, I believe the games are the evolution of, since we've been drawing on the uh, cave walls, the arrow has pointed in this direction. This is the culmination, the evolution of that storytelling. We are naturally storytellers. That's who we want to do. That's why we created language. Dude, Og, you gotta come see this woolly mammoth that I killed. Let me draw it for you. That's what we do as storytellers. And the thing that we always want to tell is the story of the relationships that we have. What, you talked about some of the hurdles that you have with mechanics traversal. What were your, what were your hurdles that you had to overcome? What do you hope to achieve with, with creating a relationship like that? You, there's, there's a whole lot of statements we can make about VR and what it means to society, but I think it's important, especially if you've seen the latest season of uh, Black Mirror, we won't talk about it, we won't spoil anything, but polar bear, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> what does it mean if we develop a relationship, because that's what you're trying to do, you wanna have this relationship with someone, what does that mean to you as a, personally, what does it mean to you as a studio, what does that mean to you as a head of Oculus, of the content of Oculus, what does it mean to us as a society if we actually develop a relationship? I, th I think what one of the things actually does is uh, open this door to understanding things that you would never be able to do. If 
you're able to basically be in the shoes of someone that you would never be in, in your real life and experience that kind of relationship. You know, we started off with uh, you know, in space or an android and, and an NPC human that plays against you and you have a connection. That was the beauty of it. It's how do you build that connection? How do people speak to you once you're in, you know, in, the, in the player's body? How, how do you develop a friendship? What she says, every time she says something, does it affect you? Does it piss you off because she's being bossy to you? We had that you know, happening. So slowly as we build the character, we realized that we could actually push and pull on the you know, emotional strings of the player. What's cool about that is that it opens the door to, I could basically put somebody in the shoes of a person that you'll never be, a man, a woman, a different color, a different you know, creed, whatever it is, and make you experience something and maybe kind of break that boundary, like that tolerance that you basically have to understand. That's where we start today. The beauty of VR is that there's nothing in the world that can actually put you in those shoes and feel like, I would have never known that that's how that person felt in that, in that Yeah, place. and again, like, if you haven't been in VR, and especially if you haven't seen something of the quality of Lone Echo, you hear this and you're like, I've played games and I've cried, or I've seen TV shows and I've cried. It's very different in VR. With Liv, she's right in your face. When you move, her head follows you. Yeah. Wherever you're going, her eyes follow you. Everyone at one point in the game, because one of the things you can do with our controllers, you can do the thumbs up so Everyone, you know, you're listening or you go thumbs up. Whatever she's doing, she keeps talking. She gives you a thumbs up back and you're like, there's this goosebumpy thing that happens because you're so, it, it's like being there with somebody in real life as opposed to, again, through the screen. And if you haven't been there and you haven't seen this, it's really hard to believe. We're demoing it on Lone Echo 2, like at the Oculus booth. If you can't do it there, do it somewhere else. The experience of being there with these characters is like the experience of being with a, a human being somewhere else. And that is the masterpiece of Lone Echo. It's not the robot hands, it's the connection with that character that is utterly virtual, but totally real.